Yeah. So uh, thank you, Asim, and uh, I'm so happy that uh, you all are organizing uh, such meetings, and uh, it is important as a milestone in the history of uh, Mahamana. And the reason is that ultimately we have three components in Tata Memorial Center, service, education, and research. Now service, all of you are doing phenomenal and I have uh, highest praises for all of you. Everybody who is working in uh, Mahamana, be it the consultant or resident, uh, this is a phenomenal work that you all are doing in Mahamana. And as I gather, uh, very soon, the number of uh, head and neck surgeries that are done in uh, Mahamana are far more than what will happen in any center, uh, which has just completed uh, three years of existence. So service is certainly uh, good. Now, there comes the milestone in the history of any institution, what we call it uh, education. And that education part actually gives a credibility to the institution. And I'm happy that now the education part is uh, uh, starting. Now we are very fortunate that uh, within three years of existence of this hospital, starting of this hospital, we already have two MCH surgical oncology seats, uh, which have been assigned. We have started the MD radiotherapy course also. And I'm very confident that in a couple of years, maybe we'll be able to start MCH in head and neck surgery in Mahamana. And third component, of course, will be research. And that uh, research component is something that you all have already started. But very soon, I'm sure that you can be uh, funded, you will be self-sufficient, you will be self-reliant, and you will be able to do path-breaking research because uh, the population is different, uh, the challenges are different, and certainly opportunities are different. And therefore, Varanasi will be Varanasi, Mumbai and South India, everybody will have their own uh, challenges and possibilities that they are working with. So congratulations once again, uh, Asim and his the entire team, Ravi. Uh, all of you have done great work and I'm here to support and all of us are here to support you in your uh, mission as we go forward. One most important thing for the youngsters is that uh, this is the formative days of your life. Use it very carefully. Use it very judiciously. Use it for something that will give a, a significant uh, rise to your portfolio when you actually go into practice. Because what happens that ultimately what matters is how strong your resume has become and that can only happen when you have good publications, you have presentations, and of course, uh, you have to think of uh, various ways of, uh, apart from uh, publication, your uh, training opportunities or uh, any other ways of improving your CV. So while those two, three years you are working or a couple of years you are working in any institution, you should be selfishly working on improving your resume because all the hospitals, where it is Mahamana, whether it is Tata, whether it is uh, any other hospital, the hospital will try to exploit you or uh, getting the work done in terms of surgery or uh, uh, OPD or uh, any other mandate that is given. But you as an individual should be very selfish and you should ensure that how do you exploit the institution? And that is where sometimes you all fail. You all are so busy uh, giving help to the consultants that you forget that ultimately when you go back home after finishing your training, what remains with you is the resume and the publications and several lines that are added to your resume. How many surgeries you did, how many you assisted, how many patients you see, that adds to your knowledge and skill. But ultimately, that can't add lines to your resume. Therefore, all of you should be very, very conscious in uh, ensuring that you make the best out of your uh, position as a trainee, as a fellow, as an observer to enhance your career. And Tata Memorial Center fortunately gives that platform 
uh, in terms of credibility, in terms of patient material, support for education and research. So all those are there. Use it and make sure that you make us proud. So again, let me congratulate Asim, Ravi, and uh, uh, Komal is there. Is Komal, there? Yeah. <laughs> Komal and and uh, I think uh, Dr. Nisha yeah. is also there. Nisha is yes, there. Nisha. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So all of you are doing an amazing work. So keep keep up the good work, Asim. Thank you, sir, for the kind words. I'll now request the moderators of the session, Dr. Pankaj Chaturvedi, sir, Dr. Kranti Kumar. He is a consultant hernic surgeon at uh, Indo-American Basav Tarakam Institute, Hyderabad. Dr. Poonam Joshi, madam, she is the associate professor of hernic surgery at Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai. And Dr. Devendra Gupta, he is a professor of ENT and hernic surgery at Army Hospital Research and Referral, New Delhi. The case will be presented by Dr. Bhavya from Mahamana Pandit Madan Moon Malviya Cancer Center. Thank you, sir. Good evening to one and all, all the respected teachers. Uh, myself, Dr. Bhavya, senior resident from Mahamana Pandit Cancer Center, Varanasi. I'll be presenting a case of oral cavity buccal mucosal carcinoma today. Uh, I'm presenting a case of 37-year-old housewife residing in Gorakhpur, Uttar Pradesh, who presented with a chief complaint of ulcer in mouth since five months. She presented with an ulcer in the left buccal mucosa since five months, which she noticed that the lesion was gradually increasing in size, initially from a small ulcer to the present size of three by two centimeter. It was associated with pain localized to the site of ulcer, mild to moderate in, moderate in intensity and aggravated on chewing, relieved with oral analgesics. Patient also complains of foul smell emanating from mouth and also that she's unable to do her routine oral hygiene, maintain her oral hygiene due to pain. There's no history of sharp teeth. Bhavya. Yes, sir. Perfect. So, Bhavya, just uh, carefully uh, analyze these uh, two points that you have shared. Yes, sir. The lesion is associated with pain localized to the site of ulcer. Aggravates yes, on chewing and relieved with oral analgesic. If I just ask the significance of this history, you have seen this case. Now, yes, I'm just asking you, what is the significance of a painful ulcer in the tongue? Uh, so painful ulcer, it could be an uh, inflammatory or an infective ulcer since, and also a malignant ulcer when it is uh, in, uh, extending or uh, invading into the nerves with perineural invasion. Excellent. Can, can be so, suggestive of perineural invasion, sir. Excellent. So what happens that you may have ulcers in the tongue. Usually yes, in the beginning, they are painless. But once they become painful, they are deeply infiltrating ulcers. And therefore, we are dealing with a locally advanced disease. Yes, sir. Correct. Because yes, unlike that, uh, anything which is uh, less than one centimeter will have this much of pain. Anything which is more than one centimeter or maybe eight to nine, eight more than eight or, uh, you know, 10 cent millimeter will have this pain. And the yes, second sir. point that you said, foul smelling emanating from the mouth. What is the relevance of this? Uh, so most of the patients, especially when they have a painful ulcer or any painful lesion in the oral cavity, they, are, they do not do their routine uh, brushing and uh, unable to take liquids or clean their mouth proper as a routine practice. So because of that, uh, uh, there's 
poor oral hygiene as well as super added bacterial infections excellent so this again signifies that she will have perhaps ankyloglossia or painful deglutition because of the infiltrative disease and yes, when she is having painful deglutition she will keep the saliva and food residues in the mouth which leads to this foul smell that is yes. one the second when you have deeply excavating ulcer then in that there is a colonization of the bacteria there is colonization of the uh, food so this both contributes to one thing that we are dealing with a locally advanced tongue cancer yes sir perfect go ahead uh, there is no history of sharp teeth or tooth ache or loose tooth ear ache no history of any other swellings in neck there's no history of reduced mouth opening or difficulty swallowing though she gives history of painful swallowing because of cheek movements associated pain and there's no history of change in voice there's no history of distant metastasis uh, suggestive symptoms like cough hemoptysis bone pain loss of appetite or weight loss so bhavya yes sir go back now why did you take the history of sharp tooth Uh, so chronic uh, dental ulcers are also known to have a malignant transformation on a long term so what's the odds ratio and which study that you can quote which says that sharp teeth or mm -hmm. dm what is dmft index not aware sir or how uh, how do you acha you are not aware of the study or dmft index uh, sir of the oh. study sir <laughs> okay so sharp teeth they are known to have a chronic irritation can you tell me the odds ratio of uh, maybe a range how much uh, contribution can happen because of the sharp teeth uh, so sharp teeth in general it causes a chronic irritation mucosal erosion leading to uh, dysplastic changes in the mucosa so i'm talking about the risk what is the odds ratio do you know what's odds ratio uh, yes sir or relative risk relative risk yes sir okay so uh, you can note down and go back and study these are very very important things that you at this stage should know yes sir okay go ahead yes sir so bhavya uh, yes ma'am so another point i would like to uh, add here is that if you see the patient gives a history of five months for a ulcer in a buccal mucosa which is easily visible uh, so one of the reason you said is because there was pain which was relieved with oral analgesics so that could be one reason for the delay in presentation so what yes. are other causes of uh, delay in uh, presentation when the lesion is so easily uh, can be is accessible and can be seen by the patient or the attendants easily so uh, what is your idea about it uh, ma'am most common what we see when we uh, encounter with the patients and their attenders is that even though they have noticed the ulcer a while ago uh, they are reluctant to get it diagnosed with the cancer fear or they have a misconception that uh, biopsy will lead to increase after biopsies the lesions have progressed for many people uh most commonly this is what we encounter in the opd ma'am so abia i think uh, if you are aware uh, we usually divide the delays into primary delay and this is a kind of uh, delays are of three types primary delay secondary delay and tertiary delay in respect to presentation of patients into our opds and this is a type of primary delay so primary delay is basically which is uh, caused at the which is at the level of patient uh, patient level Like you said, this is because of so many reasons. One you correctly said is uh, that many a times patients they lack awareness. That is one of the important cause. The other there are several reasons. There are a lot of publication. There is publication from TMH also, where we have seen that these patients are in denial. These patients usually belong to low social economic status, and it is usually difficult for them to. Uh, reach to tertiary care centers i think in that respect mamana uh, is doing a great job because now it has reached to the patients themselves so uh, i think we need to be aware that there are a lot of uh, reasons why these patients are presenting to us so late even though they are easily visible yes ma'am 
Who it? Who it? Uh, she is also a known pan chewer for five years and has stopped since three weeks. There are no other addictions, no comorbidities or prior treatment history, and there's no family history of any malignancies. Coming to the general examination, a middle-aged, well-oriented female, moderately built, well-nourished and hydrated, with a BMI of 26.5 per kg meter square, a performance status of ECOG 0, no signs of pallor or ictrus, cyanosis, generalized lymphadenopathy or pedal edema. On local examination, oral, oral cavity, inspectory findings, mouth opening was three fingers, uh, poor, uh, poor oral hygiene and stained teeth attributed to her habits of pan chewing, halitosis was noted. An ulceroproliferative lesion was noted over the left buccal mucosa, measuring approximately of 3.5 by 2 centimeter, with irregular margins, everted edges. The lesion was seen extending up to the upper and lower GBS, but though not involving the GBS, uh, gingival buccal sulci. Anteriorly, the lesion was falling short of oral commissure by 1.5 centimeter. Posteriorly, the lesion was extending up to the level of third molar. RMT was free, skin appeared normal, rest of the oral cavity appeared normal. So, Abhya, on palpation, there was tenderness and the lesion bleeds on touch. Inspectory yeah. findings were confirmed with respect to the extent of lesion. There's a palpable induration was noted of around 5 millimeter from the disc. Yes, sir. There is a question from Poonam. Uh, sir, can you, uh, thank you, sir. Bhavya, can you go back to the yeah, previous slide? Can you hear me, Bhavya? Yes, ma'am. So I wanted to ask you that you have written this mouth opening is 3.2 centimeter. Uh, yes, What does uh, convey? What is the meaning of 3.2 centimeter? What is the interpretation? Uh, ma'am, uh, I have mentioned the interincisal distance, ma'am. What have you used for measuring the interincisal distance? Uh, ma'am, routine scale I've used, ma'am. So what do we ideally what should be used Bhavya? usually the finger breadth by number of fingers it is measured so i think the ideal way to measure it is the one year caliper uh, which is described in literature but i understand that most of the places even at tmh we are not using it and we use a routine uh, scale like you have used it i think finger measurement may not be the ideal way to do it so the next yes. question here is uh, like uh, what would be the cause of so this Will this mean that the patient has trismus, Bhavya? Ma'am, she does fall into uh, grade one uh, trismus, but uh, because of pain, she was unable to open mouth, ma'am. So what are the causes of uh, trismus in a case of uh, carcinoma buccal mucosa? Uh, ma'am, in this case, uh, it is because of the uh, superadded infection or uh, involving the muscles or the neural involvement. And other than that, muscle spasm or involvement of muscles uh, by the tumor can cause like pterygoid or uh, masseter. And involvement of mesetric lesion extending to RMT can cause pain. Correct. So usually the trismus, uh, that will usually you will see in advanced cases. And one of the cause can be oral submucous fibrosis. I think that you have not mentioned it if it is present or absent. And that in because she is a, a pan chewer and I... Uh, assume that uh, with the pan she was taking probably tobacco and arecana and uh, I think here you need to mention about the presence or absence uh, of oral submucous yes, fibrosis. Ma'am, rest of the oral cavity mucosa was supple. There were no signs of uh, oral submucosal fibrosis, ma'am. Okay, okay, thank you. Go ahead, Bhavya. Oh, hello. Uh, uh, hello. Yes, sir. Just taking the oral submucous fibrosis further, uh, 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 is there any significance, uh, you know, uh, about the oral submucous fibrosis and the prognosis of the uh, patients of uh, buccal mucosa cancer, oral cavity cancer? Uh, sir, oral submucosal fibrosis, according to WHO, it has been labeled as a potentially malignant uh, lesions of oral cavity. So one of the potentially malignant lesions. Uh, with a conversion rate of at least 1.3% per year into a malignant lesion. And if a, if a patient presents with a oral cavity cancer and also has oral submucosal fibrosis, the chances of a patient developing a, a second site primary or a 
synchronous or a metachronous primary is also more so the patients are kept in follow up sir right and uh, regarding the prognosis of the present lesion we are not talking of the second primary uh like there are two patients one has got oral submucous fibrosis with the cancer and one is without oral submucous fibrosis and cancer in terms of local spread nodal spread uh sir uh, in when it uh, in fibroid uh, fibroid matrix there are uh, articles on tumor micro environment where uh, the stromal type in oral submucosal fibrosis where there is a fibroid matrix and uh, that will uh, prevent the tumor budding and also the invasiveness of the tumor right right uh, so however a... the myxoid matrix has a propensity that it favors uh, uh, extensive tumor budding and also uh, more chances of lymphovascular invasion and lymph node metastasis sir right i think there is a paper from tata uh, itself uh, regarding the oral submucous fibrosis and prognosis and the oral submucous fibrosis patients do better than um, uh, the other subset yes go ahead babina Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Any grading system of the submucous fibrosis? Oral submucosal fibrosis. Uh, uh, there's pin box staging uh, for uh, pin box staging and even canna staging, sir. Hmm. So pin we... box staging classifies it as uh, early vasculitis changes and early fibrosis and uh, stage of complications, sir. Yeah. i think bhavya there are lot of classification even for trismus but i yes, think uh, yeah, so there are various uh, ways to uh, grade the uh, type of trismus uh, yes ma'am so i think uh, similarly uh, i think that's for wesemuk also uh, i just wanted to ask you one question that in this present lesion you have described that the lesion is involving the uh, basically the left buccal mucosa And it yes, is upper and lower GBS. Uh, does it have any implication on your uh, further plan uh, or management uh, regarding the uh, uh, investigations? So, like you said, the lesion is not involving the upper and lower GBS. If it yes, would have been to the uh, restricted to buccal mucosa, will that make any difference to your further planning? uh ma'am planning definitely ma'am especially uh, even though uh, the prime investigation we will go with a contrast enhanced ct scan but the surgical planning would alter if it is involving the upper and lower lower gbs or even if it's abutting the upper lower gbs or rmt region ma'am instead of a wide local excision i uh, i may have to offer the patient uh, for even marginal mandibulectomy or upper alveolectomy if the as a board uh, to take adequate margins Okay, Bhavya. I think we'll go ahead and we'll see the next slide. We'll discuss it. Uh, on palpation, the lesion was uh, tender. Bleeds on touch. Inspectory findings were confirmed with respect to the extent of the lesion. Palpable induration was noted of around five millimeter from the visible extent of the lesion. On palpation, both upper and the lower gingival buccal sulci, the gingival labial sulci, and floor of mouth were free. Skin was not involved. neck examination there were no palpable nodes hopkins examination bilateral vocal cords were normal and mobile there were uh, rest no abnormalities or no lesions were noted ent examination scalp and uh, spine examination cervical spine examination was normal coming to the systemic examination respiratory system normal vesicular breath sounds were heard bilateral and no adventitious sounds oh uh, yeah in palpation uh did you mention about the thickness or you know the injury uh, thickness of the tumor which is actually easily accessible in buccal mucosa especially in the anterior lesions uh, so you have mentioned the dimensions of the tumor in, in inspection and in palpation we can find out about the uh, infiltration depth of infiltration so did you measure that and what is the significance uh so thickness of tumor and uh, depth of invasion uh, depth of invasion has been added uh, in the ajcc 8th edition uh, for grading of the primary tumor the t staging of the tumor sir right so uh, in palpation we can have some idea about the depth of invasion although it is not accurate uh, yes sir so bhavya 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Do we need to do Hopkins examination in a case of CA buccal mucosa like this, which is a you said is a early uh, buccal mucosa? Why do we need to do a Hopkins examination for the same? Uh, ma'am, I have included it for. Uh, completion of the examination purpose and also because it's a oral cavity cancer and especially it would be helpful for a smoker, uh, not a tobacco chewer and a smoker to look for a second primary. So uh, what is the uh, annual rate of second primary tumors, uh, development of second primary tumors in oral cavity cancers? Uh, Ma'am, around 3% per year in oral cavity cancers. So it's around 3 to 4%. And usually in patients who are uh, habitual uh, with tobacco, uh, which is either a smoked tobacco or even smokeless tobacco, mm -hmm. it is recommended to uh, include at least the upper airway uh, examination upper airway. Uh, because it has been found in a uh, few studies that the upper airway examination was found to be uh, the detection of primary in the upper airway was easier as compared to uh, in the lower airway. And oh, moreover, yeah. we include CT scan for the lower airway, CT chest for the lower airway. So a Hopkins examination is good enough to rule out a, a second primary tumor, which is simultaneous, we can say, or a syndrome. Yes, Correct. Go ahead. Um, to summarize, a 37-year-old lady, known pan chewer for five years. So, presented with an ulcerative proliferative growth involving left buccal mucosa of 3.5 by 2 centimeter size with inverted edges and palpable induration. Both the upper and the lower gingival buccal sulci, retromolar trigone area, floor of mouth, skin were not involved and no significant cervical lymphadenopathy. So, Bhavya, yes, uh, would you like to tell me that uh, a bit about the how does a pound chewer will develop cancer? Because we are assuming that the reason for her to develop cancer probably is uh, is the pound chewer, correct? Because yes, there are several uh, uh, reasons, like several causative factors for uh, development of oral cancer. And in this case, you have given us history is suggestive of pan chewing and uh, no tobacco. Uh, I don't know if there is uh, associated tobacco with that because that uh, would be important to know. Yes, ma'am. Ma uh, the patient uh, gives a history of pan chewing, which is uh, the one with the tobacco. The pan chewing per se has two different forms, one without tobacco, that is betel quid and pan chewer with uh, tobacco. And uh, in a case of a pan chewer with tobacco, uh, the constituents, the main carcinogens include uh, the aricoline, tannins, and the uh, chewable tobacco form N nitrosamines, ma'am, nitrosur nor nicotines, which cause uh, DNA mutations and DNA adduction or methylation, leading to irreversible okay. DNA repair, uh, DNA damage, and uh, dysplasia events, ma'am. So, perfect, uh, Pavia. So, I think uh, you're right that uh, pan, like you said, this pan probably is uh, with the is with tobacco, and probably along with the arachnid you said. So, this tobacco basically has tobacco specific nitrosamines. It has a lot of hydrocarbons. It has aromatic amines. It has other carcinogens. So, in smokeless tobacco, there can be up to sixteen carcinogens, which have been found uh, uh, till now. Uh, the researchers have found and in the smoked tobacco there can be up to 60 carcinogens so uh, this can contain so many carcinogens and along with the uh, ericatin which is the important component the uh, active component of arecanut which causes uh, is uh, associated with the pathogenesis of cancer like you rightly said it causes mutation at the genetic level mainly p53 mutation there is a uh, formation of DNA adducts. Yeah, then there is, yes, there is formation of reactive oxygen species. So they lead to this reactive oxygen species ultimately lead for the activation of these carcinogens. And these carcinogens, when they react with the tobacco, uh, with the DNA, they make them mutated. 
and the normal function uh, of uh, cell growth, apoptosis, or the cell cycle, it gets uh, disturbed. And this leads to the process of carcinogenesis. So I think that that is a, uh, that's the way it happens. So what is the stage of this cancer? Uh, ma'am, it's a clinical staging T2, N0, M0, ma'am. Uh, the, uh, the first, we have uh, done a contrast enhanced CT scan as well as uh, NCCT, uh, non contrast uh, CT thorax for the patient. Okay. Why do you want to do the CT scan in this patient? Uh, sir, in this patient, uh, because the uh, lesion was abutting the gingival buccal sulci, both upper and lower, uh, I wanted to know for the bone erosion, if at all, if it's present, sir. And uh, also, the extent of the tumor. Because you said the GB sulcus were free. Uh, so on palpation, it appeared free. Uh, on palpation, it is free. But, uh, uh, sir, if my surgical plan would change if uh, uh, the CT shows involvement of GBS as well as uh, bone erosion, if at all present, sir. Okay. And uh, will it upstage? Uh, yes, sir. Involvement of bone would make the disease as T4A. Mm, where is the exact location of the lesion? It is close to the RMT, right? Uh, sir, RMT region is free, sir. Free? Yes, sir. Okay. Anything else you wanted to see on the CT scan? Will it change your management? Uh, Sir, so one is skin involvement, I would like to see. That is usually seen by clinical examination, right? Yes, sir. Mm. Uh, and the other is uh, involvement of uh, muscles of muscles like uh, pterygoids or uh, masseteric muscles and also ITF involvement, sir. One point, doctor, uh, I would like to mention is that when you uh, examine a buccal mucosa lesion like this, you also need to uh, uh, you also need to uh, uh, you know be very clear on uh, stating that the skin may not be involved, but on a bimanual palpation, whether you were able whether the induration was palpable in the skin because. Uh, as we know, it's very difficult. Even the fat standing on no imaging can actually tell you whether you will get a, you know, you will be able to get the third dimension there. So a, a proper mal, pa, pa, palpatory finding, okay, of the skin may not be involved, but you need to document whether there is induration palpable. If the induration is palpable, again your surgical plan will be mostly to excise that much of skin there. So uh, that 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 information uh, can be documented, I think. So, okay, sir. So, that's a very valid point. Uh, so, in these cases of CA buccal mucosa, uh, so like you rightly said, uh, we need to see if there is infiltration of the adjacent bones. Along with the bone, uh, the infiltration of buccal mucosa cancers to the skin is a bit early. Uh, because, can you tell me the layers uh, from mucosa to skin? What are the various layers of cheek? Uh, I'm from... Inside out, it's the mucosa, submucosa, the buccinator muscle with the buccopharyngeal uh, fascia, the buccal fat pad, as subcutaneous tissue, and skin. So, Bhagna, so the whenever uh, we have a lesion of buccal mucosa, which is reaching till the buccinator, uh, till the buccinator, there is a barrier. But the moment it reaches the buccinator muscle, that barrier is lost. Like you rightly said, in the buccomesetric region or you can see the buccal pad of fat area, basically there is no barrier. The moment it crosses the buccinator muscle, it very early reaches the subcutaneous tissues. So I think uh, that is a very valid point uh, stated previously uh, by the moderator so that uh, the uh, whenever you are mentioning a buccal mucosa lesion, the, uh, we have to mention, I think you have uh, mentioned it in the CT findings, that the skin is not Moreover, on CT scan, CT is not a very sensitive uh, imaging modality or in fact, there is no imaging modality to tell you rightly that uh, if the skin is involved. Because uh, in CT, you can you will just be able to see some uh, subcutaneous fat, uh, maybe there may be substanding, but that may not be right always. And it does not have much of sensitivity. So I think that's the end. You have to see for the induration or the QD orange. 
look at this. Bhavya, about the CT scan, uh, any uh, particular technique, especially for the buccal mucosa cancer? Uh, uh, sir, no? buccal mucosa and uh, buccal mucosa, we have puff, we usually take a puffed cheek uh, C, uh, contrast enhanced CT, sir. Right, so it is uh, seen in your uh, scan also. So, Bhavya, is there MRI has any incremental value over C CT? Uh, Ma'am, MRI, especially in this case, when there is a, a confusion whether skin is involved or uh, how much of depth of the tumor it is, MRI would uh, add on points regarding the depth and uh, superficial lesions or involvement of nerve as well. So, Javier, I am not sure if MRI is also a, a very sensitive for skin involvement, but naturally we always say that it has a better soft tissue delineation and over uh, CCT uh, and it is usually complementary to CT scan yes. and because you are saying it is an early lesion T2 so in this case most likely uh, a CCT should be sufficient uh, and MRI uh, may not have any incremental value of I don't points. Uh, Bhavya, what about, uh, can you tell me about how do you, like, if you get a report, if the, if the radiologist says that there is a 1.1 centimeter uh, level 1B node, okay, yes. so critical radiologically, how do you have to interpret it? Like, can you tell me some radiological features of a neck, uh, of a uh, of a metastatic uh, cervical lymphadenopathy? Uh, sir, sir uh, nodes, uh, usually the uh, height and width of the nodes are also mentioned. Uh, plus, if there is any perinodal extension, presence of uh, necrosis, and the size of node, sir. So, necrosis and size of the node, that's all this, what the uh, thing, uh, what the radiologist sees. Are there any other features? Not that I'm aware of, sir. Okay, okay. So basically, uh, it is uh, not only the size, as you said, size is important. Okay, and size at different level, there is a there are different cutoffs. Okay, if in level 1B, the cutoff is different, level 2, there's a different cutoff of, a, you know, how to differentiate size wise between a reactive node versus a, uh, uh, versus a query metastatic node. Secondly, you need to see the shape. Okay, generally, you will have a, 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 a reactive node will be more ovalish. Okay, and a more rounded node will be more of a, you know, a more showing metastatic. Small nodes may not have necrosis all the time. Okay, but uh, a good radiologist will see uh, other factors also. As you said that a perinodal extension is, is, is again a very advanced feature. You will not be able to see it very, uh, uh, you know, in all cases. Okay, and especially when you want to, uh, when, when you have a T2 lesion, okay, with a clinically N0, and you want to probably see for those nodes. This is basically academic to see for whether there are any, you know, metastatic nodes in the in the uh, in the neck uh, by CT. Uh, I I do you have any idea on the sensitivity and specificity of CT scan for detecting nodes in in uh, in in a N zero neck? Uh, sir, in an N0 neck, there's a trial by Leo et al, which compares uh, four modalities that includes ultrasound, CCT, MRI, as well as PET-CT for uh, nodal uh, sensitivity and specificity, identification of nodes. And all four modalities, they found an average sensitivity of uh, 60 to 70 percent and a specificity of 70, 70 to 80 percent for all four modalities. Not much of a significant difference, sir. So uh, it is a it is a it's a meta analysis. It is not yes, a uh, okay, but uh, but uh, but it, it has very good findings. Okay, uh, if uh, uh, you know you're, you can go through the entire report. That, that's a uh, that, that's a valid point. Yeah. So Bhavya, yes, ma'am. Uh, Bhavya, 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 Bhavya. So what is the occult metastasis rate of nodal metastasis for a early? Uh, Buccal mucosa cancer like this? Because you uh, said radiologically it is N0. So, so what do you think could be that? Ma'am, for uh, buccal mucosa, uh, early tumors, there's an occult metastasis uh, percentage range of more than 20% uh, mentioned in various studies by Gendin as well as uh, uh, 
uh, O'Brien article and also uh, an article of N0 study by uh, TMH itself? Uh, that N0, I think most of the patients are CA tongue. Uh, I would say yes, we have a paper by uh, Dr. Walbaker, uh, by the same group only, and they have this early tumor, early buccal mucosa cancer specifically, more than 200 patients. And yes. there also, I agree with you that the metastasis rate is around uh, 24%. And most of the series, uh, I think from MSKCC also by DRs, also sh has yes. shown it to be around 26%. So it 26%. usually yeah, so it usually varies between 20 to 30%. Okay, so I think yes. we'll go ahead with the presentation. Uh, so next slide we'll go. Ma'am, the workup uh, part of it was. Ma'am, coming to the workup, other than the routine labs, I would like to get a biopsy as well as a contrast enhanced CT scan of head and neck with an NCCT thorax. And. Uh... In my case, it's a case of uh, T2, N0, M0. Uh, I would go ahead in giving option to the patient on surgical management with or without adjuvant uh, radiotherapy in the post-op period, ma'am. So, Bhavya, when we are... Yes, ma'am. Because we still are left with some time also. So, whenever we are doing biopsy of these lesions, what point should we be uh, keeping in our, in our mind for uh, residents like you and for others? Uh, I would like you to enumerate. So, doing a biopsy for a buccal mucosa lesion, uh, what all point you should be taking care of? Uh, Ma'am, buccal mucosa lesion or a tongue lesion, you, uh, oral cavity, any uh, site to tumor, the biopsy has to be done from the most representative site of the tumor and not from the central necrotic area as it will e not yield uh, the biopsy adequate or appropriate biopsy result. So how do you define a representative area, uh, Javier? And more, uh, ma'am, most common for a buccal mucosa, it would be from the edge of uh, uh, the ulcer edges or the lesion edges where uh, maximum proliferative activity is noted. Okay. So, what else would you prefer a punch biopsy or you would prefer an incisional biopsy? Ma'am, incisional would biopsy would be preferred. Why it is like that? Why would you prefer an incisional biopsy over a uh, punch biopsy? Uh, Ma'am, punch biopsy, if it is taken from the proliferative part of it, that, that does not include the subepithelium. So the pathologist will not be able to uh, give whether there is invasion or not. So if they end up giving a hyperplastic squamous mucosa as a report. So if it's an in incisional biopsy, they will have the subepithelium, which they can compare and uh, provide on the invasiveness uh, component of the lesion. Very good. Uh, perfect. So I think uh, you already rightly said that in incisional biopsy, we will be taking uh, a deep uh, biopsy where we'll be taking a part of tumor along with normal uh, mucosa so that uh, the, uh, the interface between the normal and the abnormal can be easily appreciated and they can see the infiltration of the lamina propria adequately to deem yes. it as a uh, invasive uh, Very good. So, regarding the biopsy, sorry. Yes, sir. So regarding the biopsy only, uh, do you sequence your biopsy in terms of you doing the imaging first or biopsy first or both together? Any any thoughts on this? Uh, sir, in our center, we are practicing biopsy first uh, because we would like to know what we are dealing with. If it's a tumor, should we have to go further with the radiological workup or not? Uh, but there is a controversy on whether the biopsy has to be done uh, or first or imaging because biopsy causes a little amount of tissue edema which may interfere with the radiological uh, findings, especially in case of tongue tumors. Right. Right. So it, it, it is actually a practical question. Sometimes you have a wait, long waiting list for the imaging. Uh, in that case, you do a biopsy first, and as you rightly said, that uh, you want to know the actual uh, reason for the lesion. So, doing a biopsy first. So, uh, actually, it is uh, this question is not very relevant, but we should be very clear. Uh, like, uh, our, we have our residents, ENT residents, general surgery residents. 
so there is always a confusion that we should do a biopsy first or a imaging first so we should be doing a biopsy first or if imaging is available immediately then why not if we can yes. do an imaging within a day or two then we can do an imaging also before biopsy. yes sir. so babia why do you want to do the metastatic workup in this case uh sir in this case we have done it for a, a complete workup sake otherwise for a t1 t2 lesion of a buccal mucosa with an n0 neck as it is not mandatory to go with a metastatic workup sir so what is the incidence of distal metastasis in a uh so the incidence of uh, distant metastasis in the absence of neck nodal mets is uh, less than 4% extra th uh, thoracic metastasis sir. so she is having a habit right yes sir So, could you elaborate the concept of uh, field cancerization? Uh, so, the concept of field cancerization was first proposed by Slaughter, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, the fact that any habit like tobacco or uh, smoking habit causes a, a generalized insult to the whole mucosa of the upper aero digestive tract. So mm -hmm. that causes mutations, and there are two hypotheses where uh, a person can uh, get simultaneous primaries or uh, multiple primaries. one is either by uh, multiple events occurring at the same time throughout the insulted mucosa leading to multiple primaries or a single clonal event which will uh, have a sub epithelial or intra epithelial migration leading to multiple primaries see soil theory right you can go ahead right Uh, abia how will yes, you manage what will be your extent of surgery and the approach uh ma'am for this case uh, since it's a well localized uh, buccal mucosa lesion i would go ahead or i would like to offer the patient with a wide local excision buccal mucosa uh with selective neck dissection level 1 2 3 and the primary closure primary closure primary closure or uh, if the defect is bigger we can use a buccal fat pad uh, to close the defect sir so uh, agree you said you will do buccal mucosa wide excision that will include mucoperiosteal stripping of upper and lower gbs also uh ma'am if we are getting an adequate margins uh, we need not include but for the margin sake uh, the mucoperiosteal stripping can be done of both upper and lower alveolar ridges and you will be doing a neck uh, uh, the selective neck dissection selective uh, so neck dissection what will be the extent of what all levels you will be including your in your sentinel uh, sorry selective uh, uh, neck ma'am since it's an n0 neck uh, i would uh, like to include level 1 2 and 3 ma'am okay so why not level 4 because uh, that's the routine we follow for tongue many at times so any uh, reason you will level 4 ma'am in presence of n0 neck uh, the uh, chances of occult metastasis in level 4 is less than 9% uh, in oral cavity cancers yeah, so right. level 1 to 3 uh, should suffice for the neck dissection part of it ma'am the, there are higher chances of uh, occult metastasis in 1 2 and 3 and less for 4 like around uh, less than 9% and 5 is less than 2% so i think that that bias data the question which has been put is mainly for it was for tongue cancer and it was regarding the skip metastasis to level 4 uh, and yes, i think the skip metastasis rate was around 15 to 16% in that paper but oh, however yes. uh, uh, the however the i think most of the studies uh, which have been conducted after that have shown it to be much lesser Uh, and moreover in buccal mucosa lesions the in fact the involvement of level 4 in absence of nodes at other levels other like you right is minimal i think it is even less than 9% and uh, uh, so uh, the first echelon is level 1b and then followed by level 2 so if yes. you are doing uh, your uh, uh, dissection which involves level 1 2 and 3 in an m0 ali buccal mucosa cancer that usually serves the purpose but bhavya uh, i think all of us do not agree with your this point that this lesion can be uh, closed primarily so what are the issues if you close it primarily 
uh, ma'am, primary closure, uh, because the lesion is uh, almost around 4 cm, primary closure may uh, lead to uh, scarring and difficult mouth opening or reduced mouth opening in the post-op. So what margins you will take, Bhavya, here for this lesion? What mucosal margins and soft tissue margins you will be taking, Bhavya, here around the tumor? Uh, Ma'am, mucosal margins... Uh, including up to the gingival, uh, the mucosal margins of 1.5 to 2 centimeters uh, should suffice, ma'am. And if uh, involving soft tissue, that should be around 2 centimeters. So why do you want to take 1.5 to 2 centimeter mucosal margin, Bhavya? What is the whole length of buccal mucosa? There is a concept of tumor shrinkage, right? Yes, sir. 2 centimeters will be too much. So, how much the buccal mucosa has got a shrinkage capacity compared to the tongue? Uh, sir, buccal mucosa shrinkage capacity is around 20, 20 to 30% uh, intra-op, sir. And mm -hmm. uh, an additional 20% by formalin. But we don't aim to take 2 cm margin. So, Bhavya, I think uh, there was some literature earlier, I think when I was uh, your age, then we were reading and there was some literature to support that for tongue cancers because they are known to have rich in, be rich in lymphatics and uh, they have rich vascular supply. There was some literature to support to have two centimeter margin. But over the years, we have seen that a, a negative margin of five mm or more is sufficient to achieve uh, good local control uh, rates. Okay, so for that, uh, so usually to achieve a five millimeter margin, uh, free margin, you usually take one centimeter margin. One so centimeter. that's the gross one centimeter margin because uh, the previous moderator, uh, like rightly said, there is contraction of uh, margins because if you have retraction or contraction of margins post resection. I think there is paper from uh, Tata only by Dr. Rajesh Mistri and another paper is on, uh, I think, canine, the dogs. So that has shown that there can be uh, even the buccal mucosa shrinkage is actually less than the tongue, uh, but still there can be 2 to 3 mm shrinkage of buccal mucosa uh, uh, lesions once you uh, resect it. So you have to add that 5 mm plus 3 mm. And in fact, we have a publication from Tata again with Pankaj Sir's group again, uh, with Saurabh Dutta oh. being the leading author, where they have sh shown that if the uh, gross margins are more than 7 mm, then you achieve good local control. So yeah. what I would do here is, whenever you are taking margins, you can keep it around 1 centimeter so that your gross margins come ar around 7 mm. So I think, that's, uh, I think that uh, solves that mathematics. So if you take 1 centimeter, 2 to 3 mm, you have, uh, uh, this retraction of margins, it comes around 7 mm, and with a gross 7 mm margin, you achieve good local control. Uh, considering margins in the ulcer, uh, now can you revise your uh, reconstruction primary closure or something else? Uh, so, wide local excision buccal mucosa with uh, selective neck dissection level 1, 2, 3, and uh, buccal fat pad. Uh, uh, buckle flat pad coaches or we can use the split skin graft as well sir. what are the problems with the you are focusing more on oncological concept but what about the functional aspect of the patient in the post-operative period uh, what is the mouth opening of this patient now uh, so three fingers sir. three fingers right so putting a skin graft in the buckle mucosa area where you create a raw area of around 4.5 centimeters after the excision, you expose all the masticator muscles. So, how do you expect the healing to happen if you put a skin graft? So, a lot of fibrosis is noticed in the muscles when the muscles are exposed after excision, sir. So, what if this patient comes back to you after like after three months? If this patient goes for radiation, so what is the mouth opening of this patient then? How are you going to examine this patient? So, not only the oncological, but still we need to focus more on functional aspects of this patient, right? Yes, sir. So, you want to change the reconstruction plan? 
especially for the early cancers, the reconstruction and the quality of life should be focused more because they are going to visit you more frequently and more longer. Their long-term quality of life should be kept in mind while considering reconstruction. Yes. Uh, so we can also use uh, free flaps, the free radial forearm flap uh, for the buccal mucosa defect since the defect is going to be more than four centimeter, four to five centimeter. Are there any other alternate flaps rather than radial forearm? Because radial so, forearm has its own implications in terms of morbidity. She's a 37 year old lady. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. So you have heard about lateral arm flap? Lateral tongue flap? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So for this patient, ALD. If she is having a bulky thigh, this would be little more over correction. Okay. So we can use lateral arm flap too. Okay. And we use submental flap here. Uh, so submental flap also. <clears throat> so coming to the reconstruction ladder, what do you want to use for this patient? You told us that we wanted to use it a free flap, right? Then coming to the other regional flaps. A submental or a superficial temporal artery based flap, sir. Superficial temporal artery based flap. I mean, su submental or a superficial temporal artery based flap. You mean to say temporalis muscle flap? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, your coronoid probably will be in the margin, right? Coronoid will not be the margin, sir. Sure. Okay, go ahead. So, Bhavya. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, what I would say here, uh, I think uh, the point you would put forward is that buccal pad of fat can be one option and even skin graft can be one option because they all are part of uh, that uh, reconstruction ladder. And I think that uh, the ideal reconstruction would be a free flap. But as we know, because of the workload, that may not be always possible for us due to the resource constraint situation. So if we, uh, so if we talk practically in that sense, I would say that uh, in, particularly in this case, probably it will not be a great idea to uh, use a skin graft in this case, because you said that patient has uh, trismus. Uh, and yeah. Another thing I would like to point out, Bhavya, because initially you said it is three centimeter, then you said three fingers, but they are not synonymous. So finger uh, and uh, centimeter will not be the same. So I think we should stick to centimeter because that gives us some more objective assessment. And uh, for this case, I agree that uh, by, as Dr. Deepak has written that for this case particularly, but this buccal pad of fat and SSG is not a great option like we discussed because of this, uh, this uh, large uh, size of the lesion and you'll be re removing most of the buccal mucosa and there is already uh, pre-existing trismus. Uh, but in uh, certain cases where the uh, mucosal involvement is small and you can leave behind a lot of mucosa and the defect is, I, do, I can't uh, quantify that, but usually for small buccal mucosa defects, it is okay to uh, leave it behind for secondary intention uh, healing, where there will be some contracture like in S, uh, SSG. So I think that is one option, but not for this patient. And moreover, the defect is a large defect. So the defect, yeah. here, the reconstruction, uh, like the other uh, panelists and moderators said, uh, the ideal would be to do a free flap. Even FRAP would be an option, uh, free radial artery forearm flap, but because of the hand morbidity, uh, usually uh, it's not uh, preferred by the plastic surgeons nowadays. A thin ALT would be another option. And I think there are a lot of local flaps which can be used here, but I would not be very comfortable doing some inter flap all the time. Uh, because it is a buccal mucosa lesion and level 1b is the first echelon, but that can be debated because there are a lot of studies which suggest that it is oncologically safe and there are some studies which have shown that it is not oncologically, uh, it is oncologically unsafe. So I think uh, that one thing is clear, Bhavya uh, uh, here, is that in a patient who has Christmas and has resection of large part of buccal mucosa, you should not be uh, doing it primary closer, leaving it raw, 
or putting a skin graft because all these things will lead to contracture because of the secondary uh, healing and you need to put a flap there that is a different thing that what flap you can put but you need to reconstruct it with a flap okay ma'am how so, do you want to follow this patient suppose uh, this comes as your pathologically t2 n0 n0 you do not want to give any adjuvant treatment so what is your follow up policy uh so follow up in the initially uh, up to 6 months for every 6 uh, weeks to 8 weeks and uh, for after 6 months uh, the patient can be followed three monthly up to three years and six monthly for up to five years and yearly there on for both local uh, examination as well as scans indicated only if uh, symptomatic or suspicious of any lesion sir स्टडी कंडक्टेड ऑन ब्रैकी थेरपी फॉर बकल म्यूकोसा लेशन which is not reaching the rmt or not uh, involving rmt region uh, but uh, the study has found that the, for early lesions of buccal mucosa t1 t2 it has uh, equal survival and uh, local regional control and recurrence chances so why don't we use it uh, so often bhavya so you said the local regional control rates are similar even in fact the os is similar and you said breki therapy has been used in uh, earlier years but we are not using it routinely so what is the prerequisite for using a breki therapy treatment for buccal mucosa cancer what are the pros and cons um ma'am pros is that the surgical morbidity would be reduced but uh, we are giving surgery as the first option because along with the surgery of the primary lesion we can also uh, treat or address the neck as well and uh, after brachy therapy the neck recurrences have been uh, found more and uh, since the occult occult metastasis chances is more than 20% uh, trials do recommend doing a selective neck dissection which cannot be done if we are doing uh, brachy therapy as a prime modality treatment so excellent answer bhavya uh, so i think i will just summarize this so whenever we so do you think this patient is an ideal candidate for If suppose there is no nodal metastasis and we feel that it can be treated but per se as per the primary lesion uh, also can this be treated with breki therapy what goes against that uh ma'am one is the lesion size it's around 4 cm uh, and go ahead go ahead uh that would be the major disadvantage of giving the uh, interstitial breki therapy uh, like if the lesion there is a remnant lesion then again she will have to undergo a surgery for addressing both the primary as well as neck again so bhavya uh, so you like you rightly said most of the time the size of the lesion is important like usually breki therapy interstitial breki therapy is preferred for smaller lesions like up to 3 cm uh, then the second point is because here your lesion is going towards upper and lower gps so naturally if you put a breki therapy uh, this module uh, into that uh, buccal mucosa it is going to uh, radiate the surrounding bones also so then again it is not recommended the third point is that uh, this patient has trismus so the placement of the breki therapy uh, instrument or whatever the radiotherapy uh, module would be difficult in a patient who has uh, limited mouth opening so that will be a problem and uh, fourth which is most important which you rightly said is that we won't be able to address the neck in a patient like this which is on the upper side of t2 where the chances of occult nodal metastasis is as high as 20 to 30% is right. around 20 to 20 can we give ebrt to this patient actual beam radiotherapy uh sir as a prime modality treatment yeah 
alternative to the surgery and if not uh, what is the evidence oh. so there is an article by o'brien where uh, sir the t1 t2 lesions of buccal mucosa uh, has been uh, treated with surgery as well as uh, ebrt uh, but uh, they have found the complex even though there are there is a good loco regional control the complications of uh, radiotherapy like xerostomia and long term health health related uh, quality of life impairment is more with ebrt as a treatment sir there is a very good paper by robertson so it was a randomized controlled trial where they tried to compare surgery rt versus mrt there was a premature closure of this trial because combined modality treatment has got better results so and even the ncdb data which has come where 20000 odd patients have been included in the study it shows that surgery is the better modality compared to radiation in early okay. conditions okay yes sir So, Bhavya, yes, ma'am. The role of chemo prevention, like you said, that these patients are at increased risk of uh, second primary tumors, uh, metachronos also. So, is there any uh, role of chemo prevention in these patients? Because you will be following, like we discussed, that this is a patient where the survival is better. and we expect uh, that he will be coming for uh, follow up so so do you think uh, we can give him uh, so what is the role of chemo prevention in the follow up in such patient do you think there is any role in follow up oh uh, i am not aware of the evidence regarding this ma'am uh, for, for potentially malignant lesions uh, they have shown a proven benefit but uh, not aware if we can use it as a follow up uh, for already operated or treated patients ma'am so uh, i think for potentially malignant uh, lesions also uh, there is uh, some data to su suggest that uh, the retinoic acid specifically has been found to be useful but uh, uh, mainly for the uh, leukoplakia leukoplakia lesions these leukoplakias the this uh, drugs were stopped means the uh, the drug was stopped there was rebound uh, uh, this increase in the size of the lesions and in up to 50% of the cases there was uh, this increase in the size of the lesions and there was uh, toxicity mainly to liver so and uh, there has been lot of studies and there has been use of lot of other agents like uh, even i think there is use of turmeric uh, in lot of studies human extracts yes even from tata hospital there is use of green tea so this chemo prevention there is use of interferons but still most of them are in a trial uh, phase and we don't have still a very robust data to suggest that if we should be using them uh, in the uh, for prevention of spts or in potentially malignant lesions so still it is in a trial setting so it's not a uh, used in routine So, how do you decide about adjuvant treatment in this patient? Uh, sir, if if the histopathology report, uh, the final HPR uh, shows factors like uh, positive nodes, or uh, if at all if there is a lymphovascular or perineural invasion, uh, then post-op adjuvant uh, radiotherapy would be offered. Sir. So, is there any evidence to justify for uh, perineural invasion? Exclusively, if the patient is having only perineural invasion, and if you found it's it come it comes out to be a T two N zero, well differentiated, margins are free, PNA positive. Not aware, sir. Only for perineural invasion. So you need to read these two topics like perineural and pattern of invasion, which is coming up now. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. Yes. 
so bhavi i think we are left with some time uh, so i would just ask you if this would have been a, a carcinoma of rmt or reaching rmt would your uh, treatment would have changed or your planning would have changed a bit uh, as compared to a uh, buccal mucosa alone lesion uh ma'am the surgical planning would change in term of instead of a wide local excision if it's an rmt lesion we would have to go with composite resection uh, which may involve the upper as well as the mandible resection as well ma'am uh, like a posterior segmental mandibulectomy with uh, margin uh, upper alveolectomy depending on the involvement of bone okay so i think uh, by this why i'm asking this question bhavia is uh, i just want to bring to your notice and to the notice of other students also that when the lesion uh, buccal mucosa lesion reaches the rmt uh, that uh, that is a different subside Uh, usually, once the lesion reaches the uh, RMT, the lesions become more aggressive in terms of because it is because you know that RMT lesions uh, because the RMT is at the anatomic crossroad of uh, nerve and muscles. muscles. So, so in those cases when the RMT is involved, there is a higher or the lesion is sitting on the uh, rectomolar trigone area. There is a higher risk of involvement of nerves like the previous question there can be involvement of early involvement of nerve because you know that the the location of the uh, inferior uh, this alveolar and mandibular nerve the mylohyoid inferior the alveolar and mandibular nerves of trigeminal yes, so that is a branch of mandibular nerve which is v3 so because it lies in the uh, in that area close to the rmt because you as per the this thing and moreover there is this uh, medial pterygoid muscle which can easily get infiltrated uh, by the uh, in the rmt regions so uh, so you have to be extremely careful because these once the lesion reaches the rmt from the rmt it can go to the muscle it can go to the nerve or in fact it can reach the palate also so and it can go to the pterygo uh, mandibular raphe and uh, so the extension becomes quite easier and extensive so that's the important take home message that lesions which are rmt lesions we have to treat them with more aggressive plan because they are known to spread fast because of their location and even the bone erosion is early i think we are on time uh, so what is the implication of uh, supranotch and infranotch as madam has raised this now so uh, would you like to elaborate yes. about supranotch disease as an infranotch disease uh so there's an article by leao et al where uh, the infratemporal fossa involvement or the extension of the disease of buccal mucosa involving mesenteric uh, space has been divided uh, based on a transverse line which divides uh, along the coronoid notch it either a supra notch or an infra notch disease mm -hmm. infra notch disease is uh, usually an operable disease and uh, uh, can be removed with uh, clear margins the problem with supra notch disease uh, is itf clearance or compartmental resection would be difficult in supra notch disease sir, or it becomes an unresectable disease so uh, what do we do in a borderline resectable cases so borderline resectable cases uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy can be given uh, where uh, it will uh, reduce or uh, which will help for a clear uh, getting clear margins or better margins uh, post nact for such cases so do we have any evidence for this uh sir i don't know Uh, sir, I would read on that, sir. No, no. So basically, in borderline operable cases, yes, we are trying NSCT, but there is no as such level one evidence. There is a paper from TMH article, TMH itself, where yes. there was a study conducted in TMH, where they have seen in seven twenty one of patients, I guess, and uh, they have given a criteria for uh, borderline resectable. We tried to give NSCT in those cases. Okay, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. It's not mandatory that in all borderline resectable cases we need to give NSCT, but yes, we can try. And even far away from Leao, there is a recent paper from DMH itself. Manish Mayer from DMH itself has published on supranotch diseases. 
So please read that. That is also a very good paper. Yes, sir. So you'll get a updated about supranauts and infranauts. Or what is the outcome of those patients? Okay. Yes, sir. Well presented, Bhavya. The organizers need to wind up now. Thank you, sir. Uh, very nice presentation. Very well. Uh, there are actually a few uh, questions and discussions going on in the chat box. I would like uh, to invite Dr. Asim to can continue the discussion and complete the discussion, and then on uh, we can go to uh, vote of thanks. Dr. Asim, please. Okay, so this was a very good session and discussion to start with. I am happy because I. The residents are able to discuss, they are able to put up the points and as the session progresses, all of you will be able to do much better and everybody is going to improve with this. I would request that all the residents across all centers that are there, you can write to us, you can ask us and you can make a presentation for the next time. So every Thursday, this is going to happen every alternate Thursday. So you can come up and make a presentation here. And this is going to improve your presentation skills. As you present more and more, you'll excel at presentation and develop a better idea to give examinations and also to have to see how you discuss in various conferences in the panel discussions and everything. So this is a very good platform for all of you. And that is why I encourage all the residents to present whenever possible. Whenever you get an opportunity, please present here. Thank you, Bhavya, for the nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, if, if anybody would like to make any comment, please. Uh, I think a very good uh, point was raised by Deepak, sir, about uh, second primary tumor and second field tumor. I would be glad if, we'd, if you would uh, like to say something about the topic. Deepak, sir. Hello. Uh, I'd like to think uh, over to Dr. Ravi for the vote of thanks. Okay. And I would also like you to invite for the next session, which is going to be held on 13th of January. And the presentation will be on the carcinoma of the tongue. So, uh, as already told by Dr. Asim that the next session is going to be on 13th, I would like to thank all the eminent faculty members who have taken their time off today for this academic session. And uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Bhavya for this wonderful academic and wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would especially like to thank Dr. Pankas, sir, Puna, ma'am, uh, Devendra, sir, and Dr. Kranti, sir, for coming here today and giving his time for this uh, uh, event today. Thank you, so Thank you, so Thank you so much. I think we can end. Achha, I, think, I, th I, think Deepak, I think Deepak, sir, has come. I think he would like to speak on the topic. Yeah, there's some problem with my network. So uh, I wasn't able to communicate. I would strongly urge the residents to read uh, Braquist's paper, which was published in Head and Neck, where they have looked at clonal migration versus in situ genetic changes of that population. And what is the distance that that clonal population can migrate? So they have some changes uh, made on what is a SFT, what is an SPT. So I would uh, encourage the next presentation when we have on tongue cancers, I think it'll be a very relevant discussion because that is more appropriate for tongue carcinomas than buccal carcinomas. And the other thing that I wanted to encourage the residents is that uh, all of you should learn the principles of reconstruction very strongly because trying to close a four centimeter mucosal defect is impossible. It's just not possible. And trying to retain a split skin graft in the oral cavity also is impossible. 
and you'll be resecting the buccal pad of fat anyway with your margins. And buccal pad of fat will anyway heal with secondary intention for the patient. So if you leave any mobile mucosa to heal by secondary intention, you're going to cause Christmas. So you have to be very sure, especially when you plan your cases, uh, where to use fixed mucosa, where is mobile mucosa. Because in the heart palate, you can put muscle or a skin graft. It doesn't matter because the mucosa is not mobile. But if you try doing that for a tongue or floor of mouth or a buccal mucosa lesion, you're going to cause a lot of uh, secondary intention healing. So, and I learned a very nice point from Kranti. He said that they have been doing lateral arms to the submental vessels, which I have never thought of. So it was a very fulfilling discussion. Um, the next tongue presentation, I will talk about the extension to Braquist's paper. Some There's a couple of other papers which have come for uh, genetic level uh, analysis. So I think the next discussion will also be as fruitful as this one. So thank you very much, uh, Azim and Ravi. You're very kind and I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zayn. Thank you to all the eminent faculties over there. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. I think we can sign off now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.